How many of you this week read in Malachi? You know, each time there is a homework assignment for the class is you go home and you read the, the passages we're going to look at ahead of time. But if you read somewhere in the Bible, that's good still. That is beneficial. Malachi chapter 3, before we get started, would you bow with me? <clears throat> Great God and Father, we thank you so very much for this opportunity to study your word. And as we look at the prophet Malachi and the great lessons found in his book, we pray, Father, that you will bless us with wisdom to be able to put into practice in a practical way, in an everyday way, in our life, the things that we find. We are so sorry for our sins and we repent of them and we ask that you forgive us. Pray that you'll be with us. Be with all the teachers, be with all of the children, all of the students. Help us always be a a rock in this community, a pillar. Always be uh, shining forth the light of the gospel. Help us to grow and help us to reach out. For it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Malachi chapter 3, we left off about verse 16. Verse 16 through 18 are some of the most uh, encouraging and challenging verses uh, that you'll find in this book. Malachi chapter 3, verses uh, 16 through 18. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on His name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. Here we have, verse 16 is just a a powerful verse. It just stands out to me in so many ways. It says, uh, in the midst of, of God in this book, correcting the attitudes of His people, saying, you're sacrificing, but you're sacrificing the sick and the lame. You're sacrificing uh, to me uh, things that you ought not sacrifice. You're saying it's a weariness and a dread to worship me. You're robbing me by not paying your tithes and offerings. He says in verse 16 that he is listening to those who fear him. Those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. They're speaking among themselves. And the Lord listened and heard them. He heard what was going on. He heard what was being discussed. And a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and meditate on his name. What is this book of remembrance? What's it called in other places of the Bible? The the book of life, exactly. The book of Revelation is called the book of life. Called the book of remembrance. And the first time it's mentioned... It's in Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. Verse 32. Says, Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book, which... You have written. This is Moses interceding for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. And that's talking about the, uh, that book of remembrance 
that is being spoken of in the text here in Malachi uh, chapter 3. That book of life. And Moses is saying, uh, I'll intercede, if, if, blot me out of your book if this will save them. And God says, uh, whoever sinned against me, I will blot him out uh, of my book. In Revelation 3 and verse 5, it is said of those who remain faithful, their names will not be blotted out of the book of life. So you have this book of life concept, this record, if you will. David talks about it in Psalm 69 and verse 28. Daniel talks about it in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Paul talks about it in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 3, talking about his fellow workers, the Christians there with him, who, were, who, who had their names written in the book of life. And uh, John talks about it in the book of Revelation. Uh, it's mentioned there in Revelation 3 and verse 5. Also, Revelation 17, 8. Revelation chapter 20, verses 12 through 15, where that, those books are open on the day of judgment. Anyone's name not found in the book of life would be lost. And then Revelation 20, verses 20, or excuse me, Revelation 21, verse 27. And so there's that concept of the, uh, the book of life and the concept of being blotted out. The reason why blotting out is referred to, it's, it's the concept of being erased from, from the list. Uh, acid, uh, there was no acid, I should say, in the ink that was used in ancient times. They would have either parchment or, or a piece of animal skin that was prepared, and they would write on it, and it would re remain on the surface. The ink that we use today has acid in it that burns into the paper, so it remains there. They had it on the surface, and it would dry on the surface of the parchment or the skin. And to erase something, they would just get a rag and just wipe it out, blot it out. That's how they would delete something or erase something from their records. And God is saying in uh, Exodus 32 and in the book of Revelation that if you are those, as, as Malachi says here, who fear the Lord, your name is on this list, the book of life, the register of heaven. But if you sin and you depart from Him, that name can be blotted out. When, based upon the teaching of the New Testament... When would our name get put in the book? When we're baptized, when we become a child of God. That we become registered in the book as a citizen of heaven. And if we remain faithful, that name will remain there. But if we fall away and we depart, we turn our backs on God, He will blot that name out. So that, as it says in Revelation chapter 20, names not found in that list... Whoever's not on that list is not going to heaven. They're going to go to hell. And so that's the, the, the accommodative language that's used to help us understand this book of remembrance. Help us to understand that God is watching. He's, he's, he knows. He knows what's going on. He's aware. We're under His surveillance all the time. Anyone ever watch the, the, the show uh, Person of Interest? There's a few of us that do. Very disappointed in the last episode because they very much promoted homosexuality in that show. We turned it off about the beginning of it. When we saw it was, we got, we're not watching this. But the concept, what is the concept in person of interest? Cameras everywhere. And this computer recognizes faces and anticipates crime. <clears throat> That's the concept uh, in that show, under surveillance. We're, we're constantly under surveillance by God. Not only the outside, but right in here. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you thought. He knows what you're going to think. He knows everything about us. So we're under surveillance outwardly, inwardly by God, and He takes note. Malachi 3, verse 16. 
The Lord listened and heard them. What did He say when He wrote to the seven churches of Asia Minor? I know your works. I know what you're doing. We're under His surveillance. So a book of remembrance was written before Him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on His name. Uh, Meditate there can also be translated esteem His name. Now, thinking about it from the concept of meditate, what what would it mean to meditate on the name of God? We meditate on the name of God. We meditate on the name of Jesus. What what are we doing? We're studying Him. We're, we're, We're taking Him in consideration. We're... We're looking at uh, his life, his teachings. We're told to study to show ourselves approved to God. Mm-hmm. We study. And acknowledge Him in everything that's having God's Word hidden in our heart uh, by study, uh, memorizing, having having the the message there in in our heart so that we know how to react and know what the Bible says. Uh, We should be able, if we ever, ever get into a religious discussion with people, we should be able to give what the Bible says. We may not know exactly what book, chapter, and verse it's found in, but we should be able to say the Bible says this, this, and this. And you know, if later on we need to go write it down and give them the reference, that's fine. But we need to have it in our heart to where we say, here's what the Bible says on that, and, and make, it, make it very clear. Uh, we need to meditate on the name of God or also to hold God's name in high esteem, respect. That goes with the whole concept of fearing God, reverencing God. Um, Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said we're to fear God. He's able to destroy both body and soul in hell. In Philippians 2, 12, we're to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. So the New Testament emphasizes us fearing God. God listening to those who fear Him. And notice what He says about those who fear Him, verse 17 and 18. God says, they shall be mine. Those are my people, says the Lord of hosts. Yahweh of hosts says, those are my people. On the day that I make them my jewels, that can also be translated my special treasure. He treasures us. He values us. He says, I will make them my jewels. And I will spare them as a son spares his own son who serves him. So there's that concept of God being a father, that parental concept of God loving us and caring for us as parents would their children. You know, that's also taught elsewhere in the Bible. Look at Psalm 103. Psalm 103. Verse 13. Psalm 103 and verse 13. As a father pities his children... So the Lord pities those who fear Him. For He knows our frame and remembers that we are dust. And the whole concept uh, is God will remove our transgression, forgive us, He'll have mercy on those who fear Him. See, it's conditional. It's conditional. We have to have faith. We have to have fear. We have to have love. We have to have devotion. All those go together within the mix. And as we have those, we put all those together, then we have people that God says they're mine. They belong to me. Those are my people. Those are my people. Verse 18, Malachi 3, 
Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve Him. When our minds are fixed upon God and meditate on His will, we're going to have the ability to discern between the righteous and the wicked. What does that involve? It's a word that's taboo in our, sub, in our society. Judgment. Righteous judgment. John 7 and verse 24. Don't judge according to outward appearance, but you judge with righteous judgment. If our minds are in, a, uh, in the condition they're supposed to be in, in which we meditate on God's will, we fear Him. God says, you're my people. You'll, you're my treasure. You're my special people. By the way, I wanted to tie in a verse when it comes into treasure uh, and God being God's special people. Uh, Titus, talking about the church. <clears throat> Titus chapter uh, uh, 2 and verse 14, talking about Jesus, who's our great God and Savior. Titus 2.14, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. That people that's special to God, the church. That's what he's talking about there. Going back to Malachi 3, his own special people, they are to have the mindset to, to discern between righteous and wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve Him. So if you have people who don't know the difference between the wicked and the righteous, what does that tell you about their knowledge? Very little. They don't have the right knowledge or they, they don't have any at all. Hosea 4 and verse 6 says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. So when you have people in society who say uh, it is right for two men to get married or two women to get married, and it is wrong for you to say that's wrong. It's wrong for you to say anything against that. That makes you a bigot. That makes you unloving and uncaring. We have a society that does not know how to distinguish between righteous and wicked. They don't understand that. Everything has been turned upside down. And so uh, the church, though, understands that. The church understands that. The church that's faithful to the Lord. Uh, they shall discern between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and one who does not serve Him. And that goes back to verse 16 those who feared before the Lord. They feared the Lord. So uh, when we have that respect and that, that, that attitude of respect for His Word, going back to Bible authority, back to Bible authority. Steve Hetherington was telling me about his uh, philosophy class in which they studied an overview of Christianity. The man's the professor is not a Christian, but um, <clears throat> they did an overview of Christianity. And there were people that got up and made uh, book reports and things of that nature. And those students in the school, you can just see and hear in their reports their disdain and disrespect for the Bible. They'll get up in their reports and say, oh, the Bible's full of contradictions. Oh, the Bible, you know, contradicts this. And, you know, and, and Steve you know, as much as he can, speaks up and says there's answers to all of those alleged contradictions. There's answers to all of them. But that's the young people that's growing up. They have no respect for the Word of God, no respect for the, the, the Scriptures, the authority. And uh, therefore, everyone does what's right in his own eyes. The, the problem you find in Judges is what you have today. Moral chaos. Right. 
Right. Right. Well, I'm, I'm thankful that Maya is going to a charter school where they say the Pledge of Allegiance every morning and say, one nation under God every time it's said. And so there, there are some good that's out there. And as far as uh, uh, different schools and such. Um, but the, uh, it's a problem. It's filtering in so, so much. And you've got to be aware of it. You've got to... You got to uh, uh, watch out for it and protect your children from it, and uh, be very cautious about <clears throat> what they're reading, what they're being taught, and the the, the books that uh, they are they are using. And so, when you have when you have so many that don't even know the basic basic principle of honesty, there was a survey taken one time. Um, in school concerning, uh, I think it was in a university, I don't think it was a Christian university, but it was a university nonetheless, that was asking the question, is it wrong to cheat on the test? And most people in the survey said no. If you had the answers ahead of time given to you that you could, get, that you could write down and cheat or cheat off of your neighbor, what, what's wrong with that? And then this is, these are the people that are growing up and becoming politicians community leaders telling us we need hope and change yes change is happening but not for the better mm-hmm Right. 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 And you know that's a, that's a very good point as far as fighting. I saw on on Kyle Butt's uh, Facebook page where in a public school he was able to go in there, give some lessons and give books in this public school on uh, origins, the truth about origins. From a biblical perspective, so there are some public schools that are opening it up to that, and it's because of people who are willing to fight. With people who are willing to fight, right? 
Right. That's what you're saying. They've got to go out to Kuwait, so they need to have all the options they need. Right. But I think that's basically like the Yazis. They come to our country and their rights out there, and I think we as Christians need to understand the demons come and they give up their lives and they can Right. Look at for yeah, and look for those doors of opportunity. Exactly. Psalm fifty-eight, eleven. <clears throat> So that men may say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Uh, surely he is God who judges in the earth. Mm-hmm. People need to understand accountability and reward. Um, uh, when you have the mindset, though, that you can build heaven on earth, and that's what socialism is. You can build heaven on earth. Why, why try to, to live to go to heaven when you can have heaven on earth? Jesus said, the poor you'll have with you always. You know, uh, Judas condemned the woman that broke the alabaster box of ointment and anointed Jesus. Judas condemned her for doing that and said, that money should have been sold and distributed to the poor. That's distribution of wealth right there. Judas was for all that. Jesus cared for the poor more than any human being on earth. And he said, the poor you'll have with you always. Every society is going to have the poor. And when, 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 when politicians say, we need to eliminate poverty, that, that ain't going to happen. Hey, I like Star Trek too. And the Star Trek myth is you can eliminate poverty. That ain't going to happen. That ain't going to happen. That's a fantasy. Because there's always going to be sin. There's always going to be that. We should do what we can to help the poor. Uh, But to to redistribute wealth and try to make everyone equal, that's communism. That's that's already been tried. (laughs) And it's failed miserably. So, um, anyway, let's get back to Malachi chapter 4. Who would have? Even like with Muslims coming in, we sit back and think, oh, it'll never. Right. Well, who would have dream, ever dreamed that uh, a candidate, presidential candidate, that says two men could get married could be elected? I, I, I don't care what party he's from. Anyone that gets up there and says that should not even be considered at all. So it's, we're in an environment, we're in an we're in a atmosphere in which uh, true Christianity is going to have to work even harder uh, to get anyone that resembles Christian values is going to be harder. And perhaps in God's providence, the, the nation has to totally ruin before it can be revived. Perhaps it's not totally ruined yet. And it has to be totally ruined in order for things to revive but that's you know that's neither here nor there we still have the freedom to do what we do and we need to utilize that freedom to to do what we're doing this very morning Malachi chapter 4 verses 1 through 6 (coughs) has some wonderful promises in it for behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. Now, in contrast to that, verse 2, But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and you 
uh, shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ash under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. So there's that, that big picture contrast. There's that day coming. It's going to come like an oven. What does the Bible say in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 7-9? through 9? The Lord Jesus Christ will be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them who know not God and obey not the gospel. They shall be punished with everlasting destruction. And that has to be tied in there when it talks about the wicked will be as stubble and the day which is coming shall burn them up. That doesn't mean they'll burn up and cease to exist. That's what some people take that verse to mean. That they'll be annihilated in hell and therefore they won't suffer forever. No, you've got to interpret these verses in light of what the New Testament says. And the New Testament says it's everlasting destruction. It's everlasting punishment. The smoke of their torment will go up forever and ever. So it doesn't mean burn up in the sense of annihilation. It means they're going to face God's wrath. And that's those who are proud, who do wickedly. So all the... All the pride, all the, the, those wicked who are rejoicing, those who are rejoicing over uh, the things that they do are contrary to the will of God, they can parade all they want to, but their day is coming. There's no hiding. Right. Exactly. That will leave them neither root nor branch. You know, if you have a fire, there's always that, that tree can come back. We went to Yellowstone. You could see the places where the fire burn up uh, sections of Yellowstone back in the 80s. Well, there's huge saplings growing up. They're 8 to 10 feet tall now. The earth replenishes itself. But when this punishment happens, there's no recovery from it. It's called the second death. There's no resurrection from that. Verse 2, but those who are righteous, but to you who fear the name, my name, that's reverence God, you reverence Him in your life, you work out your salvation with fear and trembling. The Son of Righteousness shall arise. Who's the Son of Righteousness? Christ, the S-O-N of God, is the S-U-N of Righteousness. With healing in His wings... And go and and you shall go out and grow fat like stall fed calves. I like that verse. Don't laugh. Verse three: You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be as ashes under the soles of your feet. They're going to be conquered, and you're going to the imagery there is you're going to walk on them. The wicked walk all over the righteous in this life, but one day it's going to be turned. And on that day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Now, think about the sun. We have a few minutes, you know, about 12 more minutes. Think about the sun. He's using the sun as, uh, as something uh, to denote the son of God, S-O-N of God. Son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. The sun, without the physical sun, we would not have life on earth. No life at all. God created the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And He set the earth about 93 million miles away from the sun, which He created to be the just, the correct type of star, the right mass, the right constitution. God created that sun. And the right distance from that for there to be life on earth and the earth is in orbit around the sun now you put that in the spiritual realm and talk about the son of righteousness s-o-n son of god without the son of god there's no life there's no spiritual life none at all he's the one who gives us life he is the light of the world it's one of the i am statements you find in the book of john i am the light of the world well, sunlight, of course, in the physical realm, we know how important that is for life to exist in the, in the physical realm. Uh, sunlight is very important, uh, physical sunlight in healing uh, 
Also, uh, there is, it, was it vitamin K that's made when you get out in the sun? Vitamin K is made in your body when you get out in the sun. I mean, those, that's just good for all kinds of things within your body. Well, when I, what is the vitamin? D. I knew it was one of the vitamins that, that your body produces when you get out in the, in the, in the sun. And, and it's good, it's beneficial uh, for you. Also, when you walk in the S-O-N of righteousness, that's good for you. And as the earth orbits the sun, what do our lives have to do? Orbit the Son of God. Everything we do revolves around Him. We have to orbit our life around Him. And so you just take all of those analogies and all of those uh, points with the physical sun and compared to the sun. He has healing in his wings. And that refers to he, uh, he has uh, benefits and healings. He is that great physician. Mark chapter 2 talks about him uh, being the physician. We go to him for healing. The blessings that are there. And the ultimate blessing is... Though the wicked shall be like ash under the soles of your feet. So they're proud. Um, they do wickedly, but their day is coming. And those are verses that, that, that help the righteous to keep on keeping on. Because when you, when you see the wicked and you, you know, I pretty much have done away with the news. I only watch the weather now. I don't want to see the news anymore you know you get to get upset when you see how much more ground and how much more progress wickedness is making in our society and to know that God is going to punish the wicked is comfort not that I want the wicked punished but that justice ultimately will be served when we study the book of Revelation what did you have in heaven when Babylon, Rome fell, rejoicing, rejoicing. The wicked enemies of the church are now gone. They're, they're, they're lost. And, and so our job is to shine forth the sun of righteousness in our life and to spread the gospel and try to get as many of those wicked people into the kingdom as possible through belief and, and conversion. Verses 4 through 6, we have the, the last words, the last written words of the Old Testament. And Malachi says, Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming and the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Verse 4, he's telling those Jews of his day, you remember the law of Moses, my servant. You obey the law of Moses. That, that was the law that they were under. <clears throat> they were under it to obey it and to keep the statutes and the judgments. And it was in effect and a law under which they were to govern themselves until when? Till when? The new law, which came about when? When he died. When he died. That's the dividing line. That is the line of demarcation between the old law and the beginning of the new law, uh, the death of Jesus Christ. Colossians 2 talks about that, and of course the book of Hebrews. So the law they were under was the law that they were to remember and to keep and to obey. Verse 5 says, Elijah the prophet. I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet. Who's he talking about there? He's talking about John. He's talking about John and the work that he would do. Uh, Matthew Chapter 11, verse 14. 
Jesus said, and if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. He's talking about John in the context. So he, uh, that is definitely referring to uh, a prophecy about the coming of Elijah. What are some parallels, very quickly, what are some parallels between Elijah and John? What made him like Elijah? Preached repentance. Elijah preached repentance. Well, Elijah didn't preach the necessity of baptism. But John did. Yeah. yeah. In the wilderness. What, where did Elijah go? He went to a cave. He was depressed. And God sent, was it, ravens to bring him food? Uh, and God says, you need to eat. You need to get up. You need to get yourself together and face um, Jezebel. He had problems from a wicked queen. John had problems from a wicked woman that was a ruler. In fact, it was what caused John to, to uh, die, caused him to be beheaded. Elijah was willing to say to the king, you're wrong. John was willing to say to the king, Herod, you're wrong. Anything about their attire was similar? Camel's hair. What did Elijah eat? Honey and locusts. So did John. They were outdoorsmen. They were they're rugged individuals. So there's several parallels there. Uh, Elijah, of course, didn't physically die. He was taken up into heaven. Verse 6 here says, And he, talking about the work of John, uh, will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. What does he, what does he mean by that there in verse 6? That would, be, that would be definitely a part of it. The hearts of the fathers be uh, uh, to the children, the hearts of the children to their fathers. Uh, fathers could be referring to ancestors, the faithful uh, of the old, uh, as you know in the book of Hebrews talks about in Hebrews chapter 11, that the, uh, the uh, ancestors uh, had a good report for having faith, people, being people of faith. He could be referring to something like that. The children of their fathers be turned to one another. That you be like the faithful of the old. You be like the faithful of your fathers. And they're, exactly. He's preparing the way for the coming of, of Christ and the, the coming of um, what would come as far as the blessings that would be there. And then it ends, lest I strike the earth with a curse. And someone has pointed out before, here's how the Old Testament ends. With a curse. How does the New Testament end? End. Verse 21, Revelation twenty two twenty one. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. A blessing. The Old Testament ended with a curse. If you don't obey the law of Moses, curse. The New Testament ends with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you have, as John said, the law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And when we obey His law, Romans chapter 8, verse, uh, Romans 8, 1 and 2, we are freed from the curse of sin. So that ends us right on time there so that's the book of malachi a beautiful challenging book that basically the message that you get from it is this you've got to live it if you're going to worship god properly you cannot live contrary to god's will and think you can just come worship god and he accept it and therefore our life must match our worship next week uh, 
I'm not sure what I'm going to go into as of yet. If you have any suggestions on any topic or any book you'd like to go into for the starting of the new uh, period here in the auditorium, let me know.